Welcome back to AgriTalk from the National Ethanol Conference in Phoenix. I want to take a look at the um, renewable fuels global picture, and it very much is a global uh, industry. We want to talk about that with Bliss Baker, spokesperson for the Global Renewable Fuels Alliance. Bliss, thanks for joining us. Tell us about the alliance and who all is involved in it. Well, the Alliance was really uh, the brainchild of a few people, uh, Bob Deneen at the RFA, Gord Quartini from the Canadian industry, and a gentleman named Rob Verhoot from Europe. Um, and we really created an alliance of uh, international industry associations to deal with inter issues at the international level. So when the World Bank, for example, comments on biofuels or the International Energy Agency comes out with papers on biofuels, we're there to respond to that and to help uh, impact those uh, statements. The World Bank seems very uh, quick to criticize biofuels and blame biofuels for all sorts of ills and problems, but and saying that biofuels you know causes problems and doesn't really help. They don't seem to want to um, make any uh, investments in biofuels, but they're willing to do that with the oil industry. Well, absolutely, I, I love to pick on the World Bank. Um, I don't like what they do, but I love to pick on them because last year alone they put eight billion dollars into oil production uh, projects around the world and zero dollars into biofuels. And it's worse than that. In fact, they don't have a policy on biofuels per se. So uh, we've been pushing them uh, on creating a policy to invest in biofuels projects, particularly in developing countries. Now, the, I will give the World Bank credit for one thing. They came out with a report this winter that said that biofuels represents an enormous opportunity for Africa and for southern African countries to be able to grow food and fuel. And that was a World Bank report, so I give them credit where credit is due, but they really do need to get their act together when it comes to uh, uh, this industry. Because for the most part, their comments, their criticisms have been very hypocritical. They, they've been horrible, and they've been ill-advised, and, and in many cases, just wrong. Um, and so, look, at I've, I've given my shot to the World Bank. Uh, uh, they need to get their, their act together, as I said, and create a, a, a sound policy based on facts and start to invest in countries where they have an abundance of land to grow food and fuel. Of course, the latest criticism of ethanol is we're it's causing political unrest and overthrows of government. I've been using Rick Tolman's line from the National Corn Growers. Rick says, well, maybe they ought to be giving us credit for bringing democracy <laughs> to countries around the world. But, I mean, I mean, this is just, uh, it's just ridiculous how, how far out some of these groups and uh, critics of uh, ethanol will go to make these outlandish charges. The, the sad thing is, some people tend to believe them. Well, that, that's true, but, but you have to understand there's a vested interest here uh, from the oil industry to protect their market share. We are taking their market share. So uh, if I were them, I'd want to protect it too. But, and, and they're going to fight. They're going to fight and defend their market share as most people would do. Uh, but uh, you know, we, have a, we, we are winning uh, battles everywhere around the world in terms of developing market share for biofuels. We're going to continue to do that. For, for a lot of good reasons, and you mentioned uh, unrest, political unrest. Right now in the Middle East, there are uh, half a dozen countries here that are in upheaval. Um, many of them are oil producers, but those that aren't oil producers uh, are, you know, custodians of the gateways for a third of the oil's, uh, uh, the flow of oil around the world through the Suez Canal, etc. So that has got to shine a big light on issues like energy security around the world. Um, and if this isn't the impetus to do more in biofuels, I don't know what is. How are biofuels perceived in other countries around the world? It varies all over the world. In Canada, for example, the government is very, very supportive of biofuels. We have a new mandate that started this year in, in 2010. Uh, they just introduced, uh, or they're about to introduce a start date for a 2% biodiesel mandate nationally in Canada. So they're very supportive. Europe has a renewable energy directive that is uh, fairly aggressive, that is setting targets for 10% ethanol um, in the future. I believe it's 2012. Sorry, 2012, 2020. Um, so they're on their way. Uh, other countries are trying. Australia is trying. They're a member of our global alliance. They're trying to develop policies as we speak. Philippines is moving aggressively towards uh, uh, biodiesel, Argentina, and, and even to some degree in southern Africa. It's very, very tough there, but uh, there are some countries in Africa now looking at biofuels. And what's driving that? Well, a lot of things. Energy security, for example. If you're, if you're a landlocked country in Africa, and you import 100% of your energy needs, and the price of oil goes from $50 to $100 a barrel, you can imagine what that does to that country's balance of payments, but you can also imagine what it does to the farmer, who's got, whose average income is $1,200 a year, and the cost of filling up his tractor just doubled. So that, those issues are driving it in many countries. In Europe, it's a, a, still a lot about climate change and greenhouse gases, um, but those are big drivers too for our industry. 
So there's a lot going on with biofuels, not only in the United States, but all around the world. We're talking with Bliss Baker, a spokesperson for the Global Renewable Fuels Alliance, giving us a global perspective on this. Later in the program, we're going to talk uh, more about DDGs. We're also going to be talking about the state of the uh, domestic uh, ethanol industry here in the United States. So we still have a lot to cover on our program today. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back with Bliss Baker. We're going to talk about, um, in this time of budget cutting, we heard the president in the State of the Union address say we need to cut to the subsidies for the oil industry. That's not seemingly getting much traction in Congress, but at the same time there are those in Congress proposing making all these cuts for ethanol. We'll talk about the inequity of that when we come back with Bliss Baker here at the National Ethanol Conference in Phoenix, Arizona. This is AgriTalk. Welcome back to AgriTalk. We're in Phoenix, Arizona for the National Ethanol Conference. Bliss Baker, spokesperson for the Global Renewable Fuels Alliance, is with us. All right, Bliss. The ethanol industry realizes the economic times we're in and that the budget cutting is going to take place and things are going to be different with the tax incentives and things like that. Hopefully, uh, they can make some changes and some cuts without eliminating totally, but we'll see how that plays out. But on the other hand, the oil industry receives so much more in the way of subsidies and support. And even though the president has talked about it, there's not been hardly, if any, traction at all towards making cuts in that. And that's kind of symbolic of how we got into some of this deficit situation we are now. Because every time they go to talk about budget cuts, they'll make some symbolic move on a small amount and say, look, we're making a cut and ignoring the much greater amounts out there, in this case, oil subsidies. So kind of bring us up to date on the disparity between what is spent subsidizing the oil industry and what goes to help the ethanol industry. Well, there's some huge uh, hypocrisy in this area, as you, you can imagine. Uh, you know, the, it's a timely question because on Friday the G20 meets in Paris. Uh, the finance ministers from the G20 countries are going to meet and they're meeting to discuss the global economy and how we can get out of this rut we're in ec uh, economically. And while they're meeting, uh, oil subsidies are escalating. We will probably surpass $400 billion in oil subsidies in 2011. 100 billion of those are direct subsidies to producers. Uh, Congressional Budget Office put the subsidies in the U.S. last year in excess of $50 billion. Uh, so we're subsidizing, uh, when you think about this, the most profitable industry on the planet. Oil is at $90 a barrel, West Texas Intermediate, probably around $90 a barrel today. And we're subsidizing this industry to pump more oil. And, and in many cases, in other countries in the Middle East, subsidizing the consumer price of oil. So, I mean, if they don't deal with those big issues like that, I, you know, there's not a lot of hope for, for getting uh, the fiscal house in order, no matter what country you're in. And we just saw a prime example that's recently in Congress where a motion to or an attempt to try to cut those subsidies went nowhere in Congress, but yet you have all these amendments cutting different uh, programs for ethanol and you got people applauding them. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a bit out of control. I mean, I, I do give President Obama some, uh, some credit in 2009. He, he passed a motion at the G20 meeting in Pittsburgh to eliminate oil subsidies. It was unanimously supported by everybody around the table, but they've done nothing since. There's been no action on reducing subsidies to oil. So, uh, and we're talking about some significant numbers. So I, I think there's going to be some very, very difficult decisions that have to be made in the near term, in the next one to three years. Very, very tough deci decisions in all countries, in the United States and Canada. And so it really does raise the issue about um, if you, government is going to play a role in supporting an industry, what industry are they going to support? And in my view, it, it's quite simple. You know, you support the industries you, you, that are uh, doing things to benefit the country, and you take money away from those that are not benefiting the country. So, and, but that's, that's going to be a long, protracted debate, I think. That's why those numbers from John Urbanchuk earlier were so interesting. I mean, it's one thing to say, let's just cut, but I think you also have to look at programs that that bring back. So you're looking at the big picture, you know, not just something that's an expense, but something that actually amounts to a return on investment. Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, you have to look at the, these issues in a in a global sense, uh, or a macroeconomic sense, to, to understand, you know, how are we going to get from where we are today to where we want to be in 20, 25 years, and then make the tough policy decisions? And uh, I can't think of bigger of a bigger issue in the world not just America, but uh, about energy security. And uh, that issue 
I think is going to be on the front burner uh, for every country if things get worse in the Middle East. It would just seems hard to justify that you're fixing the economy of this country by wiping out an industry that creates jobs and uh, helps us be less dependent on another country or countries for energy. It, that, that seems like a strange way to go about trying to improve your economy. Bliss, good to talk to you as always. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Mike. That is Bliss Baker, a spokesperson for the Global Renewable Fuels Alliance, giving us a global perspective on this uh, biofuels industry and the whole uh, challenge that we face uh, worldwide. All right, coming up, we're going to talk about uh, efforts to improve quality of DDGs. Uh, we're also going to be talking about uh, the industry as a whole, uh, some of the things that are going on um, uh, in this industry, kind of a state of the, the industry assessment, if you will. So stay with us. It's halftime on Agritech.